Thank you very much. Uh, I want to first thank uh, Yaniv for doing such a stunning job uh, organizing this meeting. So uh, I'm going to provide a potpourri of uh, different themes that are associated with this particular session, uh, microstructure, connectivity, and plasticity. Um, when one thinks about the um, ground truth in microstructure imaging, I think uh, the, the most uh, uh, characteristic uh, data set that one can use is, is what was produced by the Lichtman Lab, uh, Dan Berger doing the, you know, primarily the work there. And uh, this is cortical tissue that was removed uh, during neurosurgical procedure. Um, and uh, the Lichtman Lab is able to basically reconstruct every cell connection, uh, myelin, uh, myelinated axons in this uh, cortical section. And the way they do that is they uh, obtain uh, uh, scanning electron microscopic data in, in a multiplexed fashion uh, in these uh, hexagonal tiles. And then these are stitched together in very thin slices. And then those slices are assembled. And uh, engineers at Google, using a vast number of uh, uh, servers are able to actually reconstruct the cells and the connections, and this is quite a, a stunning uh, data set. Um, now, uh, what they typically do is they look at distributions of cells, cell sizes, and cell shapes. Uh, this is the cortical section where to the right is the uh, cortical surface, uh, layer one, and then uh, all the way down to the L6 in the deep area, and then subcortical uh, white matter. Um, but you can see that uh, the individual uh, layers, you know, have different mean cell sizes and cell size distributions. You can also see myelin. This is a beautiful depiction of subcortical white matter with myelin, uh, myelinated axons coursing radially towards the uh, cortical surface. And then you can see the tangential distribution of myelin. Um, uh, through myelinated axons in the superficial areas, L1, L2. What you don't see is the myelin coming out uh, from the uh, surface uh, here because that's uh, suppressed in this image. And one of the things that my lab is involved in is trying to get some of this information uh, not over m many months uh, and from tissue that's dead, but to try to do this in vivo in about an hour now, it's a little bit of a stretch to talk about that, but there are some features that you'll see we can recapitulate using diffusion imaging methods. Uh, I can't really go through all of the different stains that we use, but I'll tab through, and you can start to see different diffusion uh, derived stains that show different features. You can see at the, even at the uh, cortical areas, layered uh, structures that uh, recapitulate some of the uh, layers that, that one sees in these uh, uh, more, more uh, high-resolution neuroanatomical uh, structures that the Lichtman lab produces. Um, this is a very telling image that shows that not only the uh, fiber structure, but also the direction, the direction-encoded color maps. Um, now, paired with this, uh, Salim uh, in, our, in our lab uh, you know, does uh, sections of these brains and provides, um, uses uh, five different stains, parvalbumin, SMI32, and others in an interleaved way so that we can construct whole brain histological uh, uh, image that we can compare with the diffusion images. And you can see that in the upper left, uh, the MAP MRI uh, data does a very nice job identifying structures, particularly um, um, you know, in, the, in the base of the brain, where uh, many other imaging methods really are not uh, eloquent, such as uh, magnetization, transfer uh, imaging, and T1 uh, imaging, which, which are, are not very um, uh, salient, uh, eloquent in terms of identifying uh, uh, white matter structures. And in, in addition, deep gray matter structures also pop out in these high resolution MAP MRI data. Uh, for instance, uh, you can see the DEC, DEC, FOD maps in, in A and E 
uh, show tremendous uh, uh, delineation of uh, deep gray matter structures, whereas uh, magnetization transfer MT and, and F, for instance, are, are not very uh, eloquent in identifying those areas. Deep gray matter structures also pop out in uh, other areas of the brain, um, you know, in the striatum, uh, globus pallidus, and substantia nigra, where uh, some of these structures really haven't re been, a been discernible with MRI previously. Uh, we can also identify laminar patterns uh, more readily. This is a uh, the premotor area F4, you can see in the SMI32, there isn't uh, as much definition. And you can see um, in the two fir first two columns, the, the MAP MRI derived parameters show nice delineation of, of uh, a lamina, uh, whereas uh, some of the uh, stains uh, do uh, maybe a less uh, good job in some areas, and they require additional processing. Uh, in terms of uh, identifying areas uh, between, uh, regions between cortical areas, we can do a, a much better job um, than uh, in, in many other MR cases, identifying those boundaries. For instance, uh, if you look at uh, the PA in the lower left uh, and uh, the non-Gaussianity NG in the middle column, you can see that it uh, very cleanly identifies uh, the boundary between uh, cortical uh, areas. And this uh, is a number of groups, a uh, uh, number of discussions here that talked about V1 and V2. You can see very clean delineation in the RTAP in the first column in the middle. You can see a very nice delineation between uh, V1 and V2 uh, using these uh, diffusion uh, related uh, stains. And Salim is, uh, developed, has developed a, an atlas uh, based on the mean apparent propagator MRI uh, uh, along with these histological images, uh, which is, should be available now. I think it's uh, published in, in NeuroImage uh, for, for the community to use. And one of the goals that we have is to do unsupervised cortical parcellation and work by Alexandru Avram and one of our students, uh, Christopher Pass, to try to, without using an atlas, to try to do subject by subject uh, cortical parcellation. Another way in which we do microstructure imaging, we drill into the voxel, uh, is we go beyond what we were able to do with diffusion tensor imaging, which provides only an aggregate or mean uh, a description of the, the, the diffusion within a voxel. And now we use a distribution of tensors within a voxel to try to uh, cover the heterogeneity that may exist. So we may have white matter, gray matter, cerebral spinal fluid, crossing fibers, other types of paradigms that make up the voxel, and we'd like to be able to disambiguate those. So, for instance, that middle uh, row there uh, shows a mean diffusion uh, tensor ellipsoid obtained for free water or for an emulsion of cells that are spherical, and they have the same diffusion tensor, and you wouldn't be able to distinguish among them. Um, but when you start to look at some of the higher order statistical features of this distribution, you can start to tell them apart. So that bottom row, those glyphs show some of the covariance structures that we're able to now uh, estimate, which uh, easily allow you to distinguish between uh, paradigms uh, in, within the voxels. And here's an example, for instance, of using this tensor distribution method uh, you can already see uh, in, in the first row and the, uh, the second row um, evidence of layered structures in these different uh, statistical um, derived uh, uh, pr parameters like the skewness uh, or the standard deviation of the mean diffusivity. And with Susie Wong and uh, members of the Martinos community in our uh, connectome, to uh, a grant that we have with them, you can start to see in the lower right 
uh, evidence of, of lamina in vivo in humans obtained in about 45 minutes where there's, you know, we're starting to detect individual uh, cortical layers. Another way that we drill into the voxel and, and identify structures is to take advantage of a priori information that we have uh, trying to uh, identify the developmental coordinate frame. We know early in development, uh, white matter uh, courses through the cortex towards the uh, cortical surface in a radial fashion, and then uh, tangential fibers form. And if we adopt this coordinate frame, uh, we can describe diffusion in terms of plates and sticks. And this is essentially what Alexandru Avram uh, has developed, a, a, a cortex method, which is a stick and plate uh, method where we, we identify distributions of stick-like and plate-like diffusion. And here you can see this is a, a distribution of the uh, lambda R, which is the radial diffusivity, and uh, lambda T, the tangential or plate diffusivity. And we can see now the relationship uh, between these th in this distribution between the different kinds of diff diffusivities, the joint distribution. And you can now see that, that different parts of this distribution encode different areas you know, in the cortex. So let's see this number two down, down here in the second column uh, shows a lot of subcortical white matter. Number one, the green box in the upper left shows, uh, you know, layers three and four, that type of, uh, uh, so we're able to identify uh, different uh, uh, areas in the cortex uh, and subcortical regions as a, determined by the, uh, the distribution peaks that we're able to measure. Um, now, we're not only looking at diffusion per se, but we're also uh, looking at other water compartments using other relaxation parameters. And this is beautiful work that Dan Benyamini did uh, identifying um, uh, water populations uh, by T1, T2, and, and diffusion jointly, looking at the distribution of these, these parameters. And you can see that in, in this uh, ferret spinal cord, the region outside the butterfly, which is white matter, has distinctive peaks in the distributions. And uh, the gray matter, the butterfly area, has its own set of uh, peaks in terms of T1, T2, and diffusion signals. And uh, if you look at the area under the peaks throughout the, the, the region, you can identify white matter in A and D, uh, gray matter in B and E, and, and both uh, gray and white matter in C and F. So uh, we can actually, using histology, then make assignments of what these uh, particular um, spectral peaks represent. And uh, this is uh, work that's described in this neuroimage paper, but Dan is able to identify which um, uh, individual peaks correspond to which microstructural uh, parameter, microstructural features we're, we're able to identify. And then uh, this is work that Shinjini Kundu uh, and Dan and I did uh, recently looking at the cortical uh, tissue from a uh, human um, specimen provided by Dan Pearl. And using these spectral features and earth movers distance, we're able to identify uh, different cortical layers. So this uses not just diffusion data, but T1 and T2. And to show you that this is uh, work that could be done in vivo in humans, uh, on the right is uh, our, our images that Dan produced uh, in his lab at the National Institute on Aging. And to the left is work we did previously, Alexandru Avram and, and uh, Magdum Kulam and I, um, uh, looking at the diffusion T1 spectra which we're able to measure. Um, the next thing I wanted to discuss uh, that relates to connectomics and connectivity is a proposal that uh, we made uh, quite a number of years ago that manifested itself in a paper with uh, Doug Fields, and it has to do with uh, the latency connectome. Um, uh, the latency maps are used in telecom applications to look at the 
throughput in communication systems. Um, and it's basically a graph that shows the time delay of signals between one area and another, like between Houston and Dallas, uh, or San Diego and, and New York. Uh, in the context of the brain, we'd like to be able to make a map of all of the conduction delays uh, within the white matter uh, from different gray matter areas that they connect. And one of the things that we can do is build on a technique that uh, Jan Eve and, and I developed uh, back in, in around 2006 called Excalibur, where we can measure the axon diameter distribution and ax mean axon diameter in each white matter pathway. It turns out that the axon diameter is proportional to the conduction velocity. Uh, and if we measure uh, all of the white matter pathway lengths using tractography from one gray matter area to another, we can identify uh, you know, the, the path length that those impulses travel. So if we know what the speed is and we know what the distance traveled is, we can estimate the time between uh, 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 the latency that between activation and, and receiving of that impulse at the at the terminus, and that's really how how this works. We were able on a whole brain basis to make a graph of the latencies, the interconnection times between different areas, and yeah, I think this is going to be useful down the road in terms of looking at uh, a variety of disorders uh, uh, and network function. And this is only uh, obtained by structural um, mapping as opposed to, to functional imaging. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, Heidi was touched on uh, beautifully in her talk, had to do with, uh, has to do with um, uh, oligodendrocyte myelin plasticity. Um, this is a, a very interesting hypothesis that Sini Pajovic uh, has been uh, uh, proposing, uh, primarily work with Doug Fields and uh, with our lab as well, um, to try to understand uh, that how uh, impulses can be synchronized uh, with, without having uh, information about the arrival at the terminus. This was something that Heidi had mentioned in the talk. Um, how, how could information about arrival actually be propagated back through the axon? Uh, in fact, it, it doesn't have to be if this model seems to work uh, as advertised because uh, we're able to synchronize uh, the information transfer along axons by remodeling uh, myelin. Uh, each oligodendrocyte uh, is known to uh, touch multiple axons and through uh, a ladder of oligodendrocytes and the measurement of individual arrival times of impulses uh, using a fairly simple kinetic model, Sini proposed a way of synchronizing impulses so that uh, axons that fire together uh, will produce a coherent uh, synchronous impulses at the terminus. So I just wanted to provide a, an advertisement for this work because it was recently published and uh, it was a long time in the making. So um, I don't know how I'm uh, doing for time. I'm hoping we can have some time for questions. But uh, in terms of uh, the material covered, I would say mesoscopic MRI methods are greatly promising uh, for microstructure imaging applications as voxel size goes from millimeters down to, let's say, 500 or 400 microns on each side, we can start to resolve structures like lamina in the cortex uh, and uh, radial and uh, tangential patterns of, of uh, axons. Uh, and I think that's the direction that the field is moving in with connectome-like magnets. Uh, that are being produced and, and used increasingly, in, at least in a research context. Uh, the latency connectome can be assessed using microstructure imaging methods alone, uh, although they would be certainly improved by using other you know, techniques in an ancillary fashion. And um, a new mechanism has been suggested to synchronize action potentials via myelin remodeling, both uh, plating of myelin and uh, myelin depletion. So uh, with that, um, 
thank you for your attention. I wanted to, excuse me, I wanted to, to show the, the lab. I, I forgot, I, I just added this slide. This is uh, a lot of the work was done by Dr. Uh, uh, Salim Alexandru Avram, uh, Sini Shapayevich is, is, is shown, and Magnum Kulam, and Mickey Komlosh is our uh, core facility manager who makes, makes it all happen. Um, and uh, that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful talk. I'm just wondering, uh, according to your latency kind of connectome from the huge MRI, do, do you think is that possible in the future to compare uh, latency uh, prediction from the huge MRI with some electrophysiological data? I, I think it can be a little complicated <laughs> because there are just not so many electrophysiological measurement directly <laughs> available to the human. But if you have any kind of idea about how you can just combine this type of latency modeling work together with electrophysiological measurement? Well, you know, we have done, we have, we have written two papers using TMS to try to look at the motor system to see whether we could, you know, identify the latencies uh, between the left and right motor area. Uh, this was by Jean Ni and uh, Mark Hallett and other members of our group. It's very difficult in the CNS to, to make these electrophysiological measurements. I mean, EEG is, is too coarse. Um, um, MEG is, you know, we, we don't know how to stimulate within a, an MEG system, so we don't know how, how to measure latencies. So it's, uh, it's there, there really isn't any ground truth uh, that, that if you have some ideas, we'd love to hear them, but we've, we've been thinking about trying to uh, use other ancillary techniques uh, to, to improve the measurements, and it's quite challenging. The motor area is the most accessible one, because you can see the, the behavior that's associated with stimulating the left or the right motor cortex. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Peter, for a great talk. I was really interested to see the final study on the um, oligos detecting, uh, synchronizing across their axons. Can you say a bit more? So you mentioned that could be both an upregulation or a downregulation of the myelination in response to those signals. Could you say a bit more about your current and Doug's current ideas as to how that can, how that adding or removing of myelin could be happening, and over what sort of timescales those kind of modulations? could occur in response to the d detection of the signals? Yeah, I, I think one of the slides, there's a, the, some of the remodeling can happen, you know, over minutes. Like, for instance, here, there's a, you can see, according to the kinetics that uh, Cini was providing, the, the base, the x-axis is, is in minutes. And you can see s sigma d is the standard deviation of the distribution of impulses. So sigma D starts out, or T starts out at five, and then it starts to shrink over time as the impulses become more synchronized. So this could be uh, occurring on the order of minutes um, according. Now the myelin is believed to be uh, sort of being lost at a, at a, at a slow rate. Um, and then it's also the oligodendrocytes are able to plate it. So there's this uh, tension between natural loss and constant replenishment that's built into the model. Um, now, uh, it's, it's, it's just a model. I mean, we haven't, CINI hasn't identified, you know, what the uh, stimulation is for the, you know, myelin plating by the oligodendrocytes. It could be adenosine, which is something that Doug Fields had identified early on, um, uh, or it could be some other small molecule that diffuses out of the, um, you know, the, the, the individual axons. So it's, it's as I said, it's, it's, it's a model. But it, 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 it suggests a possible mechanism by which synchronization could occur without downstream propagation of information, which you, which you alluded to. 
Okay. Anyone else? Other questions? Okay. Let's thank right, the speakers. Thank